Welcome to GovCast, connecting with federal IT's top decision makers. I'm your host, Amy Kluber. Artificial intelligence is showing a lot of promise across agencies, and it's become a critical area of innovation that agencies like the Defense Department are aiming to accelerate to ensure national security. But ensuring responsible and ethical use of AI remains a challenge. The Government Accountability Office aims to tackle this with its recent AI accountability framework. Here to talk about that is GAO's very first chief data scientist. Taka Ariga has been in this space for quite some time and has some great examples here on why this framework is a necessary part of AI in government. The new framework hopes to help agencies get AI right for audits and assessments. Taka, welcome to GovCast. Great to have you today. Thank you, Amy. Thanks for having me. So what brought you to GAO? I know you're its very first chief data scientist. So what is the role that you're focused on and, and how did you get here? Yeah, I, I've been a casual consumer of GAO's product, whether it is you know, auto reports or best practices guy. And, and I think notionally, I understood the importance of GAO's mission. But really, from a data science perspective, I, I didn't really quite comprehend GAO's pan-governmental purview across all corners of the federal government. Really, you know, for a data scientist like myself, it's really a candy store. So that's what really attracted me. And couple that with the importance of GAO's mission, it was really an opportunity for us to make a, a critical difference in how the oversight community can address emerging capabilities like AI cloud services, blockchain, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, they didn't have to sell it too hard with me and I, I jumped right in. That's awesome to hear, especially things like blockchain. I know that's taking off right now in, in the tech world and government's getting its hand in it. And it's interesting to hear from the GAO perspective how technology can really you know, help auditing services. And people don't really think about that too much because you guys are like the big brother, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, our, our model is that we want an oversight to evolve with technology, right? We don't want to play that reactive mode. Uh, so, you know, as we start encountering these emerging capabilities, we have a sort of interesting dual mission. We want to explore how these capabilities can be applied as we deliver better oversight, better insights, and better foresight functions, um, but also how might we figure out how do we audit these things? Because those uh, usually are part of the sort of statutory mandate for GAO to assess whether it's AI, whether it's blockchain, whether it's cloud services or 5G, any other implementation that are being done by executive uh, agencies. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely something that we, we want to have a perspective views around. Right. And so this is kind of like your first I guess, official public service position, uh, you were previously in the private sector. Is there anything that surprised you about whether it's the agency or government, how government works at all when you first joined? Yeah, you know, in, in my prior sort of responsibilities, I've always interacted with federal agencies. So uh, having in a federal setting, you know, working in the federal setting is not new to me. Uh, but what kind of surprised me at a personal level is just the sheer scope and magnitude of the issues that federal government needs to tackle. I'll give you an example. One of my very first encounter within GAO was an interaction with our financial management assurance team. And the problem statement really centered around an audit of a $14 trillion fund called the General Fund of the United States. Now, where in the private sector do you get a chance to look at the transactional level of a $14 trillion uh, sort of institution, right? So it, it's something that just from a scale and, and just a scope perspective, it certainly does not rival anything that the private sector has to offer. But also as a public sector institution, our responsibilities for getting you know, these emerging capabilities right is paramount. So when it comes to AI, whether there are disparate impacts, when it comes to cloud services, the security aspects of those implementation, it, it's just, you know, it, it really is, is all you know, inspiring to see day to day my colleagues working hard on addressing some of these complex accountability challenges. Right. That's interesting. So what is it about I know you mentioned this a little bit earlier with the auditing oversight role. So is there anything about those roles that have become challenging in recent years when we're talking about uh, how government is thinking about technology? I mean, I'm sure it's kind of new territory from an auditing perspective. So how are you envisioning 
emerging technologies from that viewpoint? Yeah, I mean, technology evolves. As a matter of fact, 2021 is GAO centennial. So um, like many institutions, we certainly have lasted 100 years. I mean, we started with pens and pencils and, and working on paper ledgers, uh, but we still apply the same rigor around the expectation of accountability. But these days we use cloud services, we use algorithm, we use models, uh, and we certainly rely on a tremendous volumes of data. So the ethos of the, the accountability does not change, but how we go about it, the mechanics, the methodology, and the sort of a technology infrastructure themselves will evolve. And as part of a GAO's sort of second centennial, we certainly want to remain relevant as the sort of landscape itself continues to shift across the federal government. And, and this is where we want to have a prospective view and not a reactive uh, posture when it comes to a myriad of other accountability challenges that we're addressing. You also released the AI accountability framework this year, which is actually um, very telling. You know, AI is government wide being innovated right now, and it's this huge, sometimes a buzzword, really. But can you go into what that framework is and why it is? Happy to. Uh, you know, AI certainly has fundamentally transformed our day to day lives, you know, whether it's social media, whether it's GPS navigation, whether it's computer vision, facial recognition. It's very difficult to navigate a modern landscape. You know, your iPhone, your smartphone relies on facial recognition before they would uh, even operate. And even within the public sector, there are you know, certainly a lot of implementations around risk model, around computer vision, around law enforcement, national defense, uh, healthcare, just to name a few. So what GAO wants to do is we're in the business of trust but verify. But what we were seeing were a lot of conversation that essentially talks about high level aspiration on how AI should not be biased, how AI should be transparent, and how AI should have a human centered approach, which, from our perspective, very laudable ideals, but it's not, doesn't really mean much to the day to day data science. Like, how do we actually put those principles down to uh, practices and questions that program managers and software developer and data scientists can apply. And in turn, how do independent oversight bodies such as GAO can then apply our audit procedure against those implementation for us to evaluate. And that is really our uh, hope that this accountability framework drives at that question of how do we connect the high level principle down to practices in question in which in turn is turned into audit procedure that we can apply. And, and that's really how we view it as a truly accountable implementation of artificial intelligence. It's, it's really interesting because AI, when you think about AI in the life cycle and you talked about the data sets, you know, and the data scientists, where does the framework from an oversight perspective fall in the AI life cycle of a department? Is it helping them get started in AI? Or is it helping an already you know, established program really advance it more? The short answer is all of the above. We, we try to really take a look at common commonalities across AI life cycle. So whether you're in the design phase, whether you're in the development phase, whether you are now thinking about deployment and scaling of that solution, or you have already deployed it and now you really need to get into that continuous monitoring phase. We laid out specific criteria, specific procedures in which we can look at AI from any different part of that life cycle. You know, certainly AI has different sort of implication depending on the use cases, depending on the application. So for example, a self-driving car has a very different expectation of explainability than let's say a cancer screening tool. I don't necessarily care whether a car should take a right turn or left turn as long as we get to that destination safely. But as far as looking at an MRI scan or x-ray, you know, if you apply algorithmic approach, I certainly want to know why is there an elevated possibility that certain region of that scan may indicate you know, healthcare anomalies. And so there's a very different level of expectation. But what we want to do is that lay out that broad common set of you know, practices in question across what we see as generally involved in the development and, and the deployment of AI system and start asking those questions and really let 
the program uh, managers, data scientists, and auditors to then adapt the framework specifically to the facts and circumstances of those implementation that they're seeing. Right. Okay. And so when you, when we're thinking about agencies who are working with some are more advanced in AI than others, <laughs> uh, especially when it comes down to really getting the data right. Is there anything that you think agencies need to understand about emerging technologies overall when they're working with them from an auditing perspective? Yeah, and one of the reasons we developed the accountability guide using sort of plain language is that we didn't want to write a guide just specifically for auditor or specifically for data scientists. We want to make sure that the accountability framework can be used not only by you know, agency leadership, but program manager, certainly other stakeholders such as you know the legal profession, compliance officials, privacy officials, and even civil liberty advocate, and, and certainly from a general public perspective, if they're being impacted by AI, they absolutely should have a voice in that conversation. So we, we wrote it in a way that is really helping to guide implementation when it comes to a selection of data. We want to make sure that there is a rationale behind selection of the data sources, and but also selections of the variables, and those selections are not done in a haphazard kind of way. We're not saying not using, let's say, sensitive attributes such as gender or age or any other social demographic uh, sort of a criteria. I mean, those certainly have valid research uh, sort of value in terms of how they can inform the, the sort of precision and accuracy of the, the machine learning models. But what we want to see is that those selections were done deliberately. Those data were collected uh, sort of consistently and, and with a uh, sort of completeness and accuracy in mind. And certainly there's an evaluation whether that data sets properly represents the constituent in which those solutions are meant to serve. So very similar to the performance of the model themselves, are the sort of data science and mathematical techniques chosen to represent that data is appropriate where there sort of trade-off conversation, where their evaluation done that we can sort of look at the, the, the various performance metrics. And you know, certainly you know, that, that is the kind of conversation that we want to have at the individual machine learning model level. But also once you piece together an ecosystem of models, and it becomes much more of a complicated, a, a, a sort of an interconnectivity that then also needs to be evaluated as a whole. So there are multitudes of considerations here. Our approach is really using plain language, but taking an auditor's perspective to systematically decompose the complexity of AI into different parts of the life cycle development. As agencies begin to ramp up their AI and kind of thinking of how to really integrate it into their, their systems right now or in their processes, are you seeing any recurring things that are maybe problematic or a wrong way of approaching AI that would maybe fail your test? Yeah, I mean, there's a number of, you know, I, I think technology challenges, but there's certainly challenges around procurement. There are certainly challenges around the concept of ethics. When we first start developing the AI accountability framework, we were very mindful of not getting into this, my definition of AI is better than your definitions of AI. This is one question that if you ask 10 data scientists, you'll get 50 different answers. So you know, we, we, we ask all of our contributors, we're not here to admire the problems. We're here to really sort of articulate criterias. We're really here to articulate methodology. We're really here to articulate um, sort of procedure that we can uh, apply in terms of addressing accountability issues. Yeah, so you know, not consider, for example, audit rights. If you if an agency is procuring AI solution, what we want to avoid is scenarios where vendors are claiming intellectual property and not you know allowing access to either the models or the data. There are certainly cybersecurity consideration as you code these map models. It's very tempting, just out of convenience, to assign some sort of root access for that models. And now, you know, we, we've all uh, have experience with the concept of adversarial AI. So this then becomes the weakest link. If that particular model gets breached, you automatically have access to a root level credential in terms of the backend system. So there are certainly cybersecurity and aspects to that. And I will say then broaden that more holistically. Is the agency beyond the technology components able to absorb output coming out of AI? 
So AI is, is you know, the way I describe it is not automagical. It's based on set of probabilistic characteristics. So we will say more likely than not, or, you know, for example, 67%, we are sure that, you know, today it's going to be sunny versus rainy, but it is a probabilistic output, right? So how do we then interpret that as not binary? So it's not a yes or no question per se, but it, it's based on chance. And we can certainly optimize that chance depending on the kind of data sets that we look at, depending on the data science. But is your workforce ready to absorb the output from AI models to then make those informed decisions? And then do the, the sort of uh, the constituents that are being impacted have a voice in this conversation? If they don't agree with, let's say, benefits adjudication, if they don't agree with candidate screening, if they don't agree with some sort of healthcare diagnostic applications of AI, are they able to sort of see the, the sort of rationale in which those conclusions were reached? And do they have a voice in sort of elevating their due process rights relative to how the agency is delivering those missions? Uh, so, you know, it, it, I think it boils down to a lot of uh, the initial pillars of the AI accountability framework in which talks about governance. Do you have the roles and responsibility defined? Are those roles and responsibility empowered to make a difference? Are you treating AI as a team sports, not as individual sports? And I think all of those attributes will have a lot of downstream impacts in terms of how AI is developed, how AI is deployed, and how AI is ultimately scaled to serve uh, agency functions. Wow. And considering the other, uh, how other agencies have been implementing or, or releasing various frameworks of their own, how does the accountability framework or in, in your opinion, how have those other strategies fallen into this one? Did you take into account the federal data strategy in, in the creation, for example, and how do they all work together? Yeah, great question. We view it as complementary. We certainly have looked at, you know, let's start with the highest level at the international, you know, depending on our, our colleagues, looking at OECD's framework, looking at what UK has done, looking at what Canada has done, looking at what Singapore has done. We were very mindful not to come up with an accountability framework for the sake of coming up with one. We want to make sure that there's a synergy and that there's a compatibility. We certainly looked at, at the national level, what the White House has put out, what the Jake has put out, what DNI has put out, and, and certainly what NIST is sort of ongoing in terms of developing their own risk standards. And then uh, really talking with a number of sort of advocacy group, nonprofit organization, to really understand how are they pushing the conversations around accountable AI. Uh, so those were part of the initial discovery process. You know, we, we, we usually do a lot of literature research to make sure that we are as informed as we can on the background of the issue that we're tackling. And then when we formulated this panel of experts, it's really meant as a sort of a cross-sectoral. We had, you know, certainly government agency represented, we had industry providers represented academia, advocacy group, nonprofit, oversight community, et cetera, and international partners as well. And, and really having a robust and diverse conversations around standards, criteria. What do we collect? What do we do after we collect these artifacts? So those discussion, and then it, it really boiled down to a difficult task of then how do we distill that into a linear and logical accountability frameworks that people can follow, right? I go back to the notion of we're not trying to come up with a framework in some sort of echo chamber that has no relevance outside of GAO. What we're anchoring ourselves to is, is based on a very familiar framework to auditor, the generally accepted government auditing standards, where we call it the yellow book because the cover is yellow. But it speaks to how federal program must be effective, efficient, equitable, ethical, and economical. I think those are attributes that you can sort of translate readily, you know, whether we're talking about AI or whether we're talking about some other form of technology. And so when we talk about audit procedures, a lot of uh, what we have articulated are grounded in the principles of Yellow Book and the principles of Green Book so that it is a familiar language to the auditors out there, but we adapt it in a way that are still wholly compatible with the, the high level principles that have been published. And so we, we have gotten a fair number of comments where folks have evaluated GAO's accountability framework 
and have sort of given us the feedback that it is very sort of familiar in terms of what they're seeing in terms of a theme. The only difference is that we have pushed those ideals down to a level where you can start thinking about implementation, practices question, but also more importantly, how the kind of procedure that we may want to apply to evaluate them. Amazing. Is there any other emerging technologies that you have your sights on that you're, you think are, um, you know, more frameworks are coming down the pipeline for or any other innovations around? Yeah, part of the really the fun, uh, funness of my job is to really lead the innovation lab. And that is sort of our answer to have a, a more experimental computational approach to emerging technology. So it, it runs the gamut. So we, we've been talking about AI, but we certainly have been exploring how blockchain or distributed ledger technology beyond cryptocurrency might impact the way that federal government can improve financial reporting. The federal government can improve on uh, supply chain related issues. We're looking at augmented reality in a post pandemic world, uh, agency may not feel comfortable sending a team of 20 to do site visits. So might we send one plus an AR or VR goggle to really uh, sort of augment the experience of on-site visit while minimizing some of these pandemic concerns that we all still have. We're looking at cloud services. Um, you know, there's a lot of active conversations around technology modernization, but what really gets bogged down a lot of times is you know, going cloud is great, but how do we deal with the security authorization? How do we deal with some of these cultural and processy challenges? And so we are exploring ideas like authority to operate in a day as opposed to ATO in 12 months. Uh, those, I think, are, think, are sort of game-changing ideals that will not only significantly impact GAO for sure. I mean, that's why Innovation Lab exists to support our, our capacity, our capabilities in the near future. But we want to make sure that we get those lessons learned and success stories out to the world to help serve other public sector uh, institutions as well. Awesome. That's yeah. And the, and the lab, that's also an, a fairly new thing. So it, it's very exciting to kind of hear what's coming out of that, including this framework. Yeah. I mean, innovation, you know, for us, it's not just a marketing slogan, right? I mean, it's easy to say we want to innovate, but GAO essentially is an agency of professional critics. So how do we innovate within that domain? It is a tricky proposition. You know, our audits have sort of non-negotiable quality standard. Uh, there's certainly time, you know, constraint, resource constraint, budgetary constraint. And so how do we actually apply new capabilities without sort of jeopardizing what GAO is known for, our nonpartisanship, our objective stance, our really in-depth analysis of complex topics. And so Innovation Lab is meant as a sort of answer to how, you know, not necessarily impact audits of today, but how might we impact audits of tomorrow in a way that will help us usher in the second centennial. So never a dull day and, and, and we'll, you know, our, our ability to really take on the risk but really the responsibility of sharing those success story and, and lessons learned is something that I am tremendously proud of. It's something that we're looking forward in terms of elevating the capacity across the oversight community to tackle some of these really thorny accountability challenges. That's awesome. Yeah, it, it definitely sounds very empowering to be kind of in that position of, you know, making government accountable. So, and how technology is going to influence that is always top of mind. and. You mentioned the next centennial, and I, I can't even imagine what technology would look like in the next hundred years. So <laughs> fascinating all around. Yeah, I mean, for GAO, uh, we, you know, we have been known as an audit entity over the past hundred years. I think going forward, the Comptroller General has articulated this as well. We want to be known as a knowledge transfer agency. And for that, our infrastructure needs to modernize. For that, our data science capability needs to modernize. We are in the process of pushing out sort of data literacy program to make sure that our workforce are modernized to a, sort of undertake those challenges. And so it is a holistic approach in terms of how we are viewing emerging capabilities. And, and Innovation Lab is a it's sort of tip of a spear to be able to experiment, see what works, what doesn't work, and then apply that lessons and success story back to the, the broader agency. That's awesome. Taka, thank you so much for joining us on GovCast. Always great to hear about the data work that's going on in government and it's enthusiastic to be connecting with a GAO leader such as yourself, a newly 
inducted into this role. So thank you again. Thank you, Amy. It was a pleasure. GovCast is a production of Government CIO Media and Research. For more podcasts, head to our website. And please, if you liked what you heard, let us know by leaving us a review in iTunes. We continue to strive to help you connect with federal IT's top decision makers. Thanks for listening.